Carl Palachuk. He, he has been a pillar in the managed service provider and the information technology service provider industry for almost 30 years. And, you know, he does something extraordinary. When he learns something, he pushes it out. He makes videos on it. He's got over 300 standard operating procedures, SOPs, uh, for managed service providers on his YouTube channel. He He's an author. He speaks publicly. He's got two podcasts. Uh, it's just, just kind of the... It's just very knowledgeable, kind of the, um, you know, like I say, a pillar, maybe the grandfather of, uh, although he's only in his 60s, by the way, but uh, of, of the MSP industry. We talk about the term managed service provider and where it is, an IT service provider, but the, the you know, what MSPs can do and what vendors should be doing. What vendors should be doing, by the way, was very, very enlightening, but more importantly, how disciplined. Uh, really affects him and how he feels it should affect, um, you know, service providers. It was very enlightening and insightful as well. Great conversation with Carl. I appreciate him uh, for doing it. And I know you'll enjoy this conversation. Thanks for listening. Hi, I'm Joey Pins. People ask me, how did I lose 130 pounds? The quick answer is always discipline. I started my business, wasn't paying attention to my health, I was eating too much, you know, drinking too much sweets. My daughter was born. Next thing I know, I'm pre-diabetic, I have hypertension. I knew something had to change. Discipline. I, like many of you, have faced many challenges in your career, in your family, in your life, in your faith. How did you attack them? How did you approach them? How did you solve them, hopefully? It all had to have some degree of discipline. I'm also asked, how did you found and start a tech business that lasted over 25 years? Discipline. I was committed to it, enjoyed technology, didn't enjoy some aspects of it, but knew it was necessary. Discipline. Our podcast mission, how do we use discipline to better ourselves and society? Join me, please, as I talk to interesting people and discuss how they use discipline in their family and their passion and their careers and how it helped them. Our podcast vision, growth through learning from others. Joey Pins Discipline Conversations. It'll be light and serious. Join us, please. Thank you for consideration. Really, really appreciate it. Happy to do it. So is MSP, is managed service provider, the best title for IT service providers? Is it? Is it? Uh, well, it is if you're a managed service provider. <laughs> it's not if you're a, a VAR or a reseller or a solution provider or somebody who does signage or, uh, you know, they, like there's a hundred other things you could be doing. Uh, so MSP is, is one subcategory. And the, the term, uh, it's just, I just hear so many terms. It seems like more than ever now, I just hear MSSP and I hear TSP, te, you know, technology service provider. And I hear, you know, there's so many of these, uh, you know, kind of uh, other, other acronyms. So what, what are your thoughts on it? Should we synchronize? Is it an issue? Well, so... One of the problems that's happened in, in the last, I don't know, 15 years <laughs> is that MSP has become so successful mm. as a business model that vendors are seeking MSP. So everybody calls themselves an MSP and the vendors have started using it as a generic term, which is all good, except that MSP actually means something mm. and people are not using it to mean that they manage the client's technology. So I personally, I like the term ITSP, IT service provider, as a more generic term. <clears throat> so I recently uh, renamed my training site to be IT service provider university, right? And the, the National Society is the National Society of IT service providers. And that I think is a more general term so that, you know, if you can make a ton of money and be very successful as a break fix shop. So, but you should, you should not call yourself a managed service provider if you don't manage the client's technology. 
I did notice that you changed those. Uh, that's why I asked, you know, the, the asked the question. Uh, and if we talk, it's a leading question. yeah, yeah. And if we talk about break fix, of course, that we're talking about some. If something breaks, the provider fixes it. They're not. They're not uh, being proactive. Just want to clarify. Right, and and sometimes people look down their noses and. Um, you know, they use the term break fix, uh, not quite in a derogatory way, but t- to sort of suggest that those folks are providing less of a mm. service. But another way to call that group is on demand IT, mm. right? <laughs> I mean, we all started out providing IT services on demand. And then some people figured out how to do recurring revenue and to take ownership of the client's systems and provide managed services. So, and, and, you know, I I guess I like words a lot. So (laughs) for me, I I actually parse things out quite a bit. I I think the words actually matter. I agree. And and I know you do. That's why I'm I'm asking. And there are plenty of businesses that are on demand, right? Or break fix Uh, your lawyer, your plumber, your electrician, your, you know, you need a new roof. You need, you know, these, these kinds of, you know, not everything has to be a recurring service. Right. Although, I mean, uh, you know, a good lawyer would love to have you Mm -hmm. on, you know, a retainer. Right. And uh, I love the uh, heating and air conditioning industry. They're, we should follow, everybody here should follow their advertising and copy hmm. it because it's very successful. You know, they say, look, you know, get this $79 tune up in the spring. And if anything goes wrong, uh, we'll give you your $79 as credit towards the actual repair. So they get some recurring revenue. They get a little bit of whatever. The main thing they get is their sticker on your heater. Mm. <laughs> so, you know, when something goes wrong, you're like, oh, I'm going to call those guys because, you know, they owe me $79 uh, when, in fact, it's going to be a $1,500 repair. But, you know, they're going to give you your $79 back. <laughs> what a r- great point. Yeah, they do uh, do a great job of putting their little sticker on the furnace. And you're down there staring at the thing and it's cold and it needs to be hot. And you're thinking, well, I got to call these people. Also, car dealerships do that. I find myself you know, seeing cars with the sticker, I said, why are they leaving them on there? Why don't they, you know, around the license plate in the back, you know, they'll have the, the car dealership right. and that's just branding. Well, even better, they put your oil change information on your, on your windshield, windshield so that it's right there in front of you. Right. And then, and you keep counting down. Oh, I have a hundred more miles. <laughs> I have 50 more miles. Right. And then you call them unless they pissed you off for right. some reason. So uh, Fascinating. And is it a good time to be, and ITSP, MSP, TSP? Oh, uh, best time ever. I mean, it, it's it's challenging. You know, you, you can't ignore ransomware. You can't ignore the fact that the entire, you know, financial empire of North Korea and Russia are coming after your clients. Mm. But, um, you know, we have so much cool technology and so much opportunity and we really, honestly, I think our industry has done almost miraculously in the pandemic. You know, we got people out of their offices and into their mm-hmm. houses and scared up enough millions of cameras and and microphones so that everybody can work from home and and not hardly skip a beat. And they did it securely. And uh, I mean... It's amazing. And I, and I hope everybody takes this as an opportunity to begin having an ongoing discussion with clients. You know, how do we get back to the office? Are we all coming back at once? You know, are you going to have a three day work week? Are you going to rotate stuff out? Do you need a different setup in the conference room? You know, da 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 da. Uh, those conversations should happen all the time, but this is a great opportunity to start them if you haven't been doing it so far. Yeah, what a wonderful point. I, I I can't help but wonder if the pandemic happened uh, twenty years ago when this when the you know video and microphone technology wasn't as mature it is it is as now. You know how would we have handled it? Uh, but of course now the technology was available and we had MSPs, TSPs uh, rolling it out and and helping our economy. Yeah, well, it's interesting. You know, twenty years ago, you and I were on webinars and we were doing video calls. Um, So it it existed, but as you said, 
I mean, it wasn't as slick as Zoom mm. or Teams, you know, it was a little clunkier and a little harder to get set up. And, you know, now you just plug stuff in and it works. So it's a, uh, it's a great time to be in the business. You know, I consider you kind of one of the, uh, you know, one of the, you know, staple figures in our industry. I mean, the, the content that you put out, Carl, I mean, the SOPs on your, on your, on your YouTube on, you know, just the, um, the rollout that the, the, the great, great content to help so many technology service providers is really, really, it's, it's, it's excellent material. It's excellent content and you really do it to help. Um, is that your mission? It is literally the reason I exist, mm. <laughs> you know, uh, for, for 25 years, more or less, the, the single most important thing in my life was my daughter. And she's still super important. Don't get me wrong, but you know, she's off, she's educated. She's got her degree. She's got a house. She's got a job. Uh, she's got money in the bank. She doesn't actually need me, uh, except when there's you know, kitchen tiling to be done, <laughs> but, um, you know, so, so I spent a lot of time thinking about, okay, so now what's the single most important thing in my life? And it really honestly is this community. My, my personal and business mission statement is to make as many people as successful as possible. Wow. And so, and my focus is small, you know, SMB consultants. So that's, that's who I help. That's literally who I serve. And of course, SMB is small so, to medium business. Right. Yeah. And, and you do that very well. I mean, I, I can't believe one of your outlets, you know, killing it is o over 150 episodes. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Oh, yeah. Well, and the SMB community podcast, I, I'd have to look it up, but I think it's been going for 12 years. Wow. I mean, it's so, um, you know, it, it's one of those things where you, you start doing it and then you do another and another and another and you know, pretty soon you look and you say, oh, I have 300 SOP videos. <laughs> so, uh, but you know, that that's the way everything is in life. You, you keep doing the things that you, you enjoy and that other people get value out of and, uh, and you stop doing stuff. Nobody ever talks about all the things I started that failed, right? Because I just, I just literally stopped talking about it and pretend it never mm. happened. And, you know, and, and since it failed, nobody was paying any attention anyway. So... <laughs> It's just, you just keep walking, you know? Of course, SOP, standard operating procedures. You have over 300. I remember I, I would look at those and I would just get great insight. And, uh, you know, to help automate the the MSP, it's just, uh, it's absolutely tremendous, Carl. I, I um, do, you, do you ever run out of ideas? Well, not really because, you know, actually I've got a friend who, uh, is in a mastermind with me. And we've been uh, in a mastermind for about 10 years. And he keeps asking me, how do you find more things to write about? Aren't you kind of like done with that industry? What's, you know, what is there to write about? And I'm like, well, I haven't written a book <clears throat> formally on customer service. So, you know, I got to do that. And there's, you know, one thing and another thing. Um, plus, people always have questions. And a lot of my stuff, you know, the material that comes out is because somebody sent me an email and I sent them the answer. And then I took that and turned it into a blog post. And then I turned it into three different videos and uh, away you go. Wow. So uh, it's uh, it really is fun. You know, you could tell you're having fun because you do it. You do it with some, such warmth and, and and accuracy. Please explain what a mastermind is. You mentioned mastermind. So <clears throat> I belong to a couple of different mastermind groups. And basically, uh, the format is pretty straightforward. You get about five or six people together who are good friends, um, or at least people who are in the same industry or who have the same challenges. So I'm in a coach's mastermind. And so everybody in there is a coach. And I'm also in a local mastermind that's just local business owners of completely different businesses. And uh, so we get together and... The format is basically we start with, hey, what's new? Give me two minutes on what has Joe been doing for the last month since I saw you? And then we take the remaining time, and it's usually about 20 minutes per person. 
and each person brings a challenge. You know, like I'm, I'm starting to figure out that I need to divide my services in a certain way, or I need to find a name for my new offering. Mm. Um, or is this a good price point? Do you think that these, you know, price point dividers are appropriate? Whatever the challenge is, all the other people then throw in their opinions and um, information. Sometimes they'll say, oh, you got you to gotta try this tool. And of course, everybody else is writing it down and trying to figure out, oh, yeah, I need that. And I need that. And I need that. So um, one person brings the challenge, but everybody else brings the information. And everybody learns from the answers to everybody else's hmm. questions. Um, and sometimes you have people like, you know, usually I'm the one who's telling people, uh, yeah, you need to add a zero to that. You need to increase your price dramatically. But every once in a while, I'll be talking about pricing and people will turn around and say, yeah, you know, you need to raise the price on that. Mm. <laughs> so, you know, we sort of support each other in that way. And every once in a while, somebody will come up with a really great resource and we just email it to each other and, you know, share it and help each other to be successful. You know, everybody can be in a mastermind. Everybody can be a mastermind person. It's just a matter of focusing your attention for, you know, an hour, hour and a half on these other people who are putting their attention on you at the same time. And the difference between that and a peer group? Well, um, usually peer groups uh, come together. There's not a lot of difference. A peer group could actually be a mastermind, but usually peer groups... Um, one of them is a leader or maybe there's a rotating leader and, uh, they usually come together with specific focus. So it might be that, oh, we're going to talk about, you know, marketing this month, or we're going to talk about, you know, whatever it is. Um, and so it's just structured a little bit differently. Um, some peer groups are led by a coach, right? In which case, there are, let's say, 10 peers and one coach. And that has the advantage that the coach sees a lot more businesses than the individual members do. Um, but the true peer group where everybody's peers is closer to an actual mastermind group. Mm. Yeah, very interesting. And, I, you know, I've, I've been in peer groups uh, for a long time, but I've always often heard the term mastermind. Is it an actual affiliation? Is it an actual organization? It's not an organization, but um, <clears throat> you can actually look up the most famous mastermind groups of all time. Uh, there used to be a mastermind group where Woodrow Wilson and Henry Ford and um, Thomas Edison, you know, some of the the biggies from that day. They, you know, uh, uh, Goodrich. They would they would literally go out on camping trips together, huh. right? And you think about the smartest men alive at the time just hanging out, smoking cigars, you know? <laughs> and, and so it isn't a, there's, it's not a brand name. You don't have to pay a license fee to everybody. Um, and it, it really, a lot of people say that it goes, the concept goes back to uh, think and grow rich, right? You've heard of that. Of so, um, and so it, it's literally just a thing anybody can organize. Very interesting. You know, you, you can start one this afternoon. Most of the masterminds I've been involved with we don't have fees and we don't charge each other anything, you know. Um, you want to try to get people who are roughly in the same, um, facing the same challenges as you. So you might be in a mastermind with somebody who's a, a dentist and somebody who's an attorney and somebody who is a small uh, um, hardware store owner. But they're all roughly at the same level in terms of revenue and challenges and so forth. Um, it, it, you rarely see a mastermind where one person is, you know, has revenue of $20 million a year and the next person has 1 million. Um, it's usually they're, they're fairly uh, even. Now, having said that, you always want to invite somebody who's just a little bit of head of everybody else. Right. But that person needs to get value out of it as well. So they're looking for somebody in a mastermind that's doing better than they are and on and on and on. So <laughs> you sort of notch your way up over time. Uh, but, you know, if you, you know, you with peer groups, 
there's somebody who's at $330,000 a year and somebody who's at 3.3 million and um, they can be in the same peer group and still both of them can find value in that. That's always the challenge because they, they most likely have different struggles, you know, um, depending on where they are. I know when we, we, you know, we acquired a bunch of companies back in the nineties and we jumped from, you know, a couple million to, you know, to six, 7 million. And then, you know, all of a sudden there's a whole level of middle management and there's, you know, it was just a very, a lot of different challenges that, uh, that were there for us. What, what do you think are the, the, the biggest challenges for MSPs today? Well, I, you know, to me, I think the biggest challenge is for people to slow down and spend time really learning what they want to do and where they want to go. Mm. Too many people jump in and just, you know, they're so, we're so action oriented in the 21st century, but a lot of people, they, they need to stop and, and take the advice that they've heard a thousand times, figure out who your clients are. Mm. Figure out what you want to sell and how are you going to sell this to those clients. And and once you've got that figured out, lots of other stuff falls in place. And so many times you've seen it, people get online and they say, oh, when you start out, you have to take a nickel from everybody you can find. And I'm like, no, no, the smartest way to go is to say, whose nickels do I want? Do I want attorney nickels? Do I, do I want restaurant owner nickels, right? Who do I want my clients to be and how can I serve them? And then lots of other things fall into place because you stop chasing after every buddy and every penny that you can find. Um, and once you do that, I think uh, your business just automatically becomes a little more successful. So I, I honestly think that's the biggest challenge is focusing, you know, just just focus before you start acting. It's so important because you know, you want to be everything to the client, you know, you want to be all their outsourced IT, but uh, at the same time, there are certain areas that you can't handle. You know, I, I think of one thing, I remember so many times we tried to dip our toe into, into UCAS, right? Into telephony. And it was, you know, it's just something we didn't do. And it's, it's just a completely different beast. And, you know, we should have partnered with somebody. And uh, that's just one example of knowing what your, your strengths are and who you're going to deliver it to. Right. And, you know, it's so true that if you're going to go into a new area, you need to slow down a bit and be educated. You know, like when we looked at telephony, I went out and bought some hardware and built an asterisk box and, you know, configured it all and set it all up and so forth and came to the conclusion, if I start selling this, I have to have an asterisk expert on staff mm -hmm. for the rest of my life. <laughs> Right. And I just decided I, you know, that's not, not where I want to go. And so I took it apart and did other stuff, um, you know, but, but you have to make those decisions consciously. Um, and that's why, you know, I, I think it's great that vendors are so involved in the SMB space. They, you, you know, you can go to a show, meet six or eight new vendors that you never heard of before, uh, try their stuff out and see if it's a good fit for your business. And, um, it's, it's interesting that a lot of the larger, uh, MSPs don't actually attend these shows. Mm. And I think that they are missing out on a great deal of opportunity, uh, because they somehow think it's beneath them because they've already made, you know, the, the three or the five or the $7 million mark. Um, so I'm always pleased when I see larger vendor or larger uh, MSPs at the shows. That's a very, really good point. How often should MSPs or even SMB small businesses uh, fire clients? Well, it's funny because I talk about that so often. It's amazing. Uh, I, I literally just taught a class this morning on customer service where I talked about you know how you start with your ideal client and then you develop services for them and then you develop you hire employees who are geared towards serving them. But what do you do with your existing clients? And the, the reality is um, probably, I would say at least once every three or four years, you need to weed your client garden because you will have changed. Your business will have evolved. You'll be selling different things. You'll be focusing on different people. And somebody who was a great fit three years ago may not be a great fit today. So I don't think you should like 
weed them out every year, but maybe every three or four years. And how about, you know, dividing clients A, B, C, and D, and when you get a new A, fire a couple of Ds? Well, actually, that's that's great advice. That's I always attribute that to Eric Simpson, right, <laughs> classically, um, that if you are growing and you you either gain or get rid of a really big client, you have to think about where that fits in your business. Mm-hmm. Um, I... Uh, I learned a lot of lessons by firing my largest client on two different occasions. Wow. And in both cases, it freed up a lot of energy and um, activity in my company and allowed us to become more successful because we replaced them with better clients who were a better fit, who didn't argue with us as much. And were they allowed us to manage them and they were more profitable. Uh, at the same time, you know, there was a point where I just realized I can't make money off of somebody who buys a thousand dollars worth of stuff a year. I need somebody who can pay me a thousand dollars a month, right? And so I got rid of the clients who were too small for me to provide them with appropriate services and make money. And you know, I feel sorry for people who don't have IT support, but on the other hand, I am not responsible for everybody who <laughs> shows up on my doorstep. You know, uh, I have to build a business based on people who can actually afford my services. Very well put. And when you met, I assume you had quarterly business reviews with your clients and, you know, what were common discussion points there? Did you review everything outside of your scope that they may need? Well, I tried very hard to have quarterly business reviews. Most clients just will not schedule them that often. Um, But I always required clients to have a minimum of one a year, Mm. right? So I had at least once a year, we'd have an annual roadmap meeting is what we call them. And the best clients who engaged the most actually grew the fastest and were the most successful because Mm. the conversation was a lot about uh, how is your business going? What are the challenges? What new technology is coming to your business, to your industry? You know, what are what are the big challenges that your industry faces that I have no idea about because I don't do that for a living. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, And so it gives them a chance to complain. It also gives them a chance to say, well, there's this new technology that we can't afford or that it it just it would change our business too much. And so you say, "Okay, tell me about that. Mm -hmm. Right. And then you help them understand the technology, help them understand kind of the bigger picture and eventually they buy into the consistent messaging that you put out. For me, that was replace your equipment every three years. And that way, everything is always under warranty. You know, you buy business class equipment with a three-year warranty, you replace it every three years, nothing breaks because it's always under warranty. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And so, so now I get the credit for managing your system when you know, a good chunk of that has to do with the fact that it's new. It's not full of viruses. It's not, you know, full of patches. It's not slowed down by the fact that it's old, clunky, patched hardware and software. Um, but those clients who engage in that process most fully um, literally bought stuff from us all the time. And they brought us into discussions where a lot of other clients didn't. So they might be thinking about making a move, like what would it cost us to move to this building? Can we get the good internet if we move there, right? Other clients just call you one day and say, hey, we moved. Mm. You're like, uh, who moved your server? Who moved your, your your printers? Who moved your equipment? Oh, we just unplugged it all and we're like, uh, right? So clearly the clients who engage in the conversation are better clients all around. Um, and sometimes you find the better clients and sometimes you have to build them from scratch, <laughs> but you know, that's, that's your job. That's why, you know, I like managed services. I like to grab the client's technology and say, I will take care of this for you. You need to trust me. Yes. That costs money. Yes. It's worth it. It's an investment in the long run. Very well put is will managed services ever be commoditized? Well, only if people choose to commoditize themselves. Uh, you know, there are there are people who say, "Oh, you know, I always have to end up competing on price." 
And I always say, no, you don't, right? Mercedes sells into the same car market uh, as Chevy uh, and they don't, you know, compete with Chevy on price, right? They, like they don't even think about competing on price. Tesla doesn't compete on price. Oh, guess what? We're cheaper than a smart car. Uh, no, <laughs> right? So, you know, I don't know why people choose to put so much pressure on themselves because it's just as easy to go find a client with money who is interested in quality service. Mm. And uh, I've written a couple of things recently. I firmly believe you are more likely to lose your best clients to somebody who's more expensive than you, than you are to lose your worst clients because they're too cheap to uh, pay mm. your prices. Mm. Your best clients are not focused on money. Your best clients are focused on service. They want technology to improve their business and help them to be more successful. And if somebody comes along and says, you know, I charge $100 a desktop more than Joe, but man, do I provide much better service. Your best clients will find that appealing. Your worst clients will run away. <laughs> They'll run back to you. <laughs> So uh, I think people have a tendency to commoditize themselves. Um, I think a lot of what's gone on with mergers and acquisitions has forced people to think of, of themselves as a commodity, right? Uh, a friend of mine runs a very interesting and unique business, managed service business. She does not use ConnectWise or Autotask. She does not use the standard RMM tools. Um, she does not fit into the mold uh, that you see in managed services in a month, right? And so these people who come along with a bunch of money and say, I'm going to gobble up all the MSPs, generally they say, well, I'm looking for people who use ConnectWise and, you know, this tool set or Autotask and this tool set. And so they just, they gobble up the ones that look like them because they can integrate them much mm. more easily. Um, so if you just follow somebody else's path to success, you become a commodity, right? The, the biggest complaint I hear right now today in 2022 from people who are trying to sell their business is that everybody's bottom feeding and offering half price. And you have to be, you have to stay with the business for a couple of years. And the reality is if you just didn't sell your business, work for three more years and walked away, you'd make more mm -hmm. money than letting these people write you a check and, you know, becoming their indentured servant for two years. So, you know, those people have sort of commoditized themselves because they have chosen to look at their competition and follow them instead of looking at their clients and finding out what their clients want. If every one of us just looked at our clients, all of our businesses would be very, very different. Mm. But when we look at each other, there's a tendency to say, oh, I want to be like that. Or, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to be more like him. I'm like, oh, okay. The more you are like your competition, the less uh, unique you are. I mean, by definition. Yeah, it, it's an excellent point, Carl, the correlation between commoditization and mergers and acquisition, because, you know, they just look at the P and L, you know, and, and, uh, you know, try to merge them, you know, there was always a, I shouldn't say a fear, but there's always this perception that the cloud was going to hurt, you know, MSPs servers are not going to be in clouds anymore. They're going to be up in the, in the, in the cloud. And then w right now we see a, a different kind of shift going from infrastructure to really information where there's so many, you know, just apps that their clients are getting that they just get that are born in the cloud. Uh, do you see a, an issue with that kind of shift from infrastructure to information? Well, there's always going to be a shift. I mean, that, that's the beauty of technology. And you just have to be nimble. I mean, one of the things that uh, happens probably every eight to 10 years uh, is that either a recession or a major shift in technology causes a bunch of people to say, you know what, I'm done. I, I am not going to learn one more layer of technology. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to. I remember when the recession hit, the cloud, a lot of people don't realize this. If you think about it, the cloud literally became mature during the recession mm -hmm. that started in October of 2008, right? That was li literally like the moment where a bunch of people stopped spending, 
a bunch of people left the industry because they refused to learn about cloud services. And when the recession was over, small business server was gone and uh, everybody was moving to the cloud and the people who didn't want to move to the cloud had left the industry and it was literally this watershed event. And so now we see that a lot of people are saying, oh man, I, I'm just not going to learn all this stuff with NFTs and Bitcoin and clients trying to pay these different ways. And, you know, people who are have born in the cloud technology and everything as a service, right? It's just too much for them, right? So everybody's got their own threshold. Um, but if you focus on your clients, once again, you can learn the technology, mm. you know, uh, I like to remind people, you know, during this podcast, during this interview, something will be invented <laughs> and within five years, it will grow. It will take over the universe. Someone will become the most talented and expert in that technology than anybody else. And then it will proceed to begin to die off. All of that will happen in the next five years, starting today or starting at this very moment. And that what that means to me is you could be that expert. You could rebuild yourself and your business and take on that new technology and be the most expert person in the entire world. And that happens every day, all the time with new technologies. So people who, who choose to opt out, they are literally just deciding, I will not learn anymore. Mm -hmm. I, will, I will stop learning and I will just try to freeze my business and hold on for the last year or two, and then I'm out. Uh, and that's, sadly, that's the way a lot of people end up leaving, you know, their business behind. What a really good point about going into the cloud during that recession in 2007, 2008, much like the pandemic has forced remote workforce. Right. Well, and that's, again, you know, there are people who say, I, I have to have my employees in the office. I have to be able to look at mm. them and, and stand over their shoulder. You know, there are people who are investing in all of this monitoring software to see how often you, you your eyes contact the camera, <laughs> you know, whether or not your mouse is moving and, you know, all this kind of crap. Uh, you know, there are people who are just not ready for remote work. There are jobs where you can't do it, obviously, mm. but, uh, you know, during the recession, uh, March of 2020, I came home March 5th and uh, I sent a note to my clients or to my uh, employees. And I said, hey, we're going to be working remotely at least till the end of the month. <laughs> so two years later. <laughs> so one of my employees who used to sit, you know, 10 feet to the left of me moved to Michigan. <clears throat> Another one who sat on the other side uh, moved to the Bay Area. And so I just recently hired a new person who's part time in the office. Uh, but my other employees are like, they just left. Right. They're, they're, they're in another state or another part of the, the my state. Uh, so, you know, there are businesses that, that, you know, are able to work remotely and there are businesses that are not. And there are people who can re work remotely and there's managers who can manage remotely. Um, and I think we just have a stronger awareness of that than we had before. Because again, you have been working remotely for a decade or so, yeah. right? And, and we've been able to do this for a long time. It's just the rest of the world has finally figured out that we weren't kidding. You really can work from everywhere. You certainly can. And before you were mentioning vend, you know, uh, shows, conventions, and vendors that are there, um, do you think many MSPs are over-tooled? Uh, over-tooled, that's a good question. I think there's probably a great deal of overlap between some of the, the capabilities of the tools that people invest mm -hmm. in. You know, you, you get a, a tool that does everything and then you buy a bunch of other tools that do a little of this, a little of that. And there's a lot of overlap. I think most, most people could probably cut back significantly and um, do manually a few of the things that they've done automatically especially the smaller uh, MSPs. Um, you know, in general, I don't have any problem with investing in tools, uh, but I do think that people have to be very careful to make sure that they figure out how they're going to pay for that stuff. Mm. I've actually seen people who say, you know, I add a little something. I go to a show and I, and I, I see something cool. And I'm like, oh my God, my clients have to have that. And they buy into a new vendor. 
but they don't raise their prices. And so they go to, you know, uh, Channel Pro or Ask or whatever, and they go to one show after another, and they add a vendor and a vendor and a vendor, um, but they don't raise their mm. prices. And so after about two years, uh, all their costs have gone up, but not their prices. And ultimately, every piece of your business has to pay for itself. And I, and I mean that exactly and precisely. Your PSA has to pay for itself, or you need to get rid of it. Mm. Uh, your, your RMM has to pay for itself or you need to get rid of it. And that doesn't mean you charge per item or per, you know, endpoint, but the big picture, right? I love the cloud bundles because I say, look for whatever, $400, you get this. Uh, and then it's up to me to manage what the components are and how they work together and how efficient they are. Um. Uh, but a lot of people just go buy something and then implement it, but they don't really, they don't figure out the money side of things. And so what they're providing and what they're charging get kind of out of whack with one another. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you could see that now where people buy, you know, subscriptions, just I'm talking about consumers to, to, you know, video subscriptions, they watch a movie and then they forget they have it and they're paying every month for it, you know, and uh, there's just so much of that. And there's actually apps out there that track that. I, I, I wonder if we're just stumbling an idea an idea here, Carl, where we have, uh, you know, tracking all your expenses, your, your tools in an app and <laughs> seeing where the waste is. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I, I keep an Excel spreadsheet of um, all the recurring payments that show up on my credit cards, right? And every once in a while, one will show up and I'll be like, what the hell is right. that, right? And then I'll go look and I'm like, oh, yeah, I was off on, you know, whatever, sitting on a beach and I'm like, oh, man, I totally need that. And I subscribe to something. And then I look back, like, whatever, six months later, I'm like, I'm paying $12 a month for that. And I forgot that I even bought it, like... <laughs> But consumers do that all the time. And to be honest, it's one of the benefits of managed services, right? That you got a flat fee and that's it. It's also why, like I love the cloud five pack is you sell somebody a bundle of five licenses. And so whether they have three employees or four employees or five employees, it's still basically the same. And it, and it helps them uh, accept that that's an ongoing price. So you just have to remember that there will be a day where somebody be on a beach and say, wait a minute, I have two employees. I'm paying for five licenses. <laughs> you know, it, you, you got to be ready to, to answer that question because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we enjoy being on the receiving side of recurring revenue. But uh, remember, somebody else is on the, the spending side. What can vendors do better to work with MSPs and understand MSPs? Well, I think... My personal experience, the best vendors to work with are the ones who really educate MSPs, educate their partners. Um, ultimately, this industry lives and dies on how well educated service providers are. And, you know, and that's, you know, part of that is knowing your technology, understanding you're, you're going to fix this. Okay. You need to know it. You don't, you can't look it up on Google the day that you're sitting at a client's office. Um, but vendors can help by saying, look, here's how you run your business with our technology. You know, when I go to any show, uh, no matter what it is, channel partners, anything, I go in and I ask vendors, why should I engage with mm. you? And I don't want them to tell me because I have the best menu options and let me show you this feature and here's these graphics. I'm like, no, nope, I don't give a, you know what I mean? I want to know how I'm going to make money if I engage with you. And, and that has to be, you know, the discussion. Otherwise, I'll go to the next booth. And so educating me on how I make money, whether it is a cybersecurity product or hardware or software or management or monitoring, right? There's so many things in our industry. How do I make money with what you do? And to be honest, there are vendors, not, not many in our space, but a handful that they can't explain what they do. Mm. They just keep coming back to how amazing and whiz bang it, everything is. And um, I, I won't engage with them, you know? And so, so I think the best vendors are the ones that actually educate people, not just on their product, but on how they actually make money with the product. And, you know, probably... 
the best in this industry, you go back 20 years, was Arnie Bellini telling people, here's how you make money with this thing, that you're going to enter tickets and you're going to keep track of everything and you're going to run these reports, right? And literally people, when I first heard about ConnectWise, people were coming out of the woodwork saying, oh my God, this guy's going to show you how to make money in this business. And people were would say, I've been in business 20 years. He's got nothing to teach me. It's like, okay, <laughs> fine. You, you, you stay there. We're going to move over here. And, you know, ConnectWise and Autotask really did a huge, uh, you know, they, they brought great benefits to this industry by teaching people how to make money with their products. And I think more vendors need to do that. It's an excellent point. Excellent point. Just what is the bottom line, uh, you know, with our partnership? So, Carl, I, the, the common thread of the podcast is, you know, discipline. I lost a lot of weight. People always ask me how, you know, like there's some silver bullet. I just say discipline, you know, have, have business for a very long time. Do you consider yourself disciplined? And how do you how does it factor in your life? Well, I try to be, um, you know, my most recent book is the absolutely unbreakable rules of service delivery. Um, you know, we have things like I literally have rules. There's a there's a poster right there on my wall. Uh, everybody who works for me gets a little poster with my my absolutely unbreakable rules. And they're things like we get prepaid for everything. So you want to do business with me? That's cool. Uh, payment first, business later. Right. Uh, we. Uh, slow down and get more done, right? That That's a rule that's got a lot of layers to it, but it helps us to be more successful. So, and, and of course the SOPs, you know, some people think that I must be the worst boss in the history of the world. Like I've got an SOP for how we name files, right? And on the other hand, little things like that just make everything work more smoothly. And so, we don't waste time, effort, and money looking around like, ah, what's what was the name of that file? Well, it should be exactly and precisely this, this, and this, <laughs> right? So you don't you don't have to worry about what the name of the file is. It's obvious what the name of the file should be, and so you just go look for the only file that should have that name, right? Um, and little things like that. A great example of a <clears throat> of discipline is I have a rule that when anybody in my company, and, and I've seen this with anybody who's ever worked for me, we create a directory called, you know, bang, exclamation, bang tech on the uh, C drive of every machine that we build. And that's where, uh, and it's a it's bang tech because then it gets sorted at the top of the directory listing, right? So you sit down at any machine that anybody who's ever worked for me built, and in the bank tech directory, you will find all the hardware drivers, all the license keys, the software, the logs, everything you need to know to manage that machine. Wow. And when you think about, you know, you sit down in a machine, you don't have to like go poking around for a folder that says software or uh, licenses or whatever. You, you look for the only thing in the only place it should ever be on every machine and it should be there. Think of how many thousands of hours of labor that has saved my companies over the last 20 years, right? Because there's no thinking about where is mm -hmm. it and what is it and where do I put it and how do I, but no, it's right there. So at some level, that's a simple SOP, but at another level, it's kind of like a layer of discipline that brings consistency across time and space, right? Mm -hmm. Like literally there are people who used to work for me who now own their own companies and they are doing that with every one of their machines. Wow. And, and literally it's, it's saving thousands of dollars by saving, you know, thousands of pennies, uh, and, and lots of time. So, uh, that's why I have so many SOPs It's like, there is a, there's a, there's a way to do everything and your way might be different than my way, but you better have it documented. Yeah. And then there's no room for mistake or interpretation. It's all documented in an in, in SOP. And, you know, the, what's, what's admirable about to me, Carl, about you most is that, you know, you run successful business, but you, you get all this knowledge that you have and you just give it out. You just share it. You, you take the time to record it. You take the time to, uh, 
speak. You take the, you know, all these SOPs are up on the YouTube, on your YouTube site. It's, it's amazing that, you know, you, you took that extra step. You've taken the mastermind, the peer group, all this knowledge, all this expertise, and you're, you let it out there. You're an author. Uh, it's, it's extraordinary, Carl. Well, oh, thank you. That's very nice of you. <laughs> yeah. And just one of the main, just one of the, I don't know, founders pillars of, of MSP. When I, when I, when I think of it, uh, I, I just uh, admire, uh, admire that most about you. And uh, thank you so much for your time today. I, uh, I, I really enjoy your insight. I love listening to you on your on the different podcasts. How can we get in touch with you? I've got a lot of websites here, but how how would you like people to <laughs> get in touch with you? You know, I manage about a dozen websites that can somehow, one way or another, uh, um, take a payment, uh, and I have about twenty websites that feed into those. So my goal is that you know you should never be more than one click away from me on the internet. Mm. So um, probably Small Biz Thoughts, B-I-Z, smallbizthoughts.com is a great place to start. Uh, my community is smallbizthoughts.org. Um, but, uh, you know, I have, like you say, I have the podcast and everything. Um, over at smallbizthoughts.com or smallbizthoughts.org, you should be able to get to a link with my newsletter. And that is, uh, to me, the, the easiest way to get engaged because... Every week I have a calendar of live events in the community and um, also links to all the videos I made in the last week and the podcasts I made in the last week and the blog posts in the last week and, you know, all, all the things that all of my different brands are doing. So um, that's the one place where you can you can get a, a, a link to everything uh, is with my newsletter. Yeah. And of course, you can. You can connect with me on LinkedIn and Facebook and all that other stuff. So yeah, I've been getting that newsletter for a long time and yeah, it's, it's really good. And I encourage you already to do it. I'll put it in the show notes. Uh, and you're, you're still in, in Sacramento, correct? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So very good. Yeah. I've been in Sacramento for over 30 yeah. years. So yeah. Did you consider yourself a Californian? Oh, I do now. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So I was, I was born in North Dakota yeah. and my parents were smart enough to get out of there and we moved to Washington state and, but I was raised in the snow and then I went to the university of Michigan and there was more snow. And so, uh, I, I moved to Sacramento and I'm like, okay, I never have to be where it's cold again, except by choice. You know, I'm, I'm going to CompTIA again, going to go to CCF in Chicago in March. And it's like, ah, I will be cold. But, you know, it, it's for a reason. It's for a good cause. And then I can go home and it'll be warm again. Sure turn. So. Yeah. Carl, <laughs> thanks so much for your time. I, I'll see you on the circuit this year. I will definitely be out there and uh, maybe we can have a cup of coffee and continue the conversation. Thanks so much for your time today. Very good. Well, thanks for having me. You be well. I appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you for listening and or viewing Joey Pinn's Discipline Conversations. Please share this episode with one or two of your friends who you think may benefit from the episode. Our website, www.joeypins.com. There you find lots of resources and you could join our mailing list. Please follow us on all our social media, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook podcast information the video version of our podcast is on youtube please subscribe audio is on all major podcasting platforms please follow them and if you like it please consider giving five star rating would really appreciate that would you like to financially support the podcast you can go to our patreon site consider five ten or twenty dollars a month there's all kind of plans that we have there it's like a one-time payment. What is this podcast episode worth to you? $25, $50, $100, $500, $1,000, $5,000. You be the judge. You can go to our PayPal account to do that as well. Thank you again for listening or watching Joey Pinn's Discipline Conversations.